Welcome to Scene at the Academy. I'm Michael Ordonia of the Los Angeles Times, and I'm delighted to be speaking today with the directors and producers of Cherry from Apple TV+. Cherry is about a nice young man who falls in love, goes to war, comes back with crippling PTSD, and along with his wife, becomes a hardcore opioid addict. The two of them then turn to bank robbing to fund their addiction. Here we have the uh, filmmakers, Anthony and Joe Russo. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you guys again. Um, there's a lot to talk about with this film because of some of the extreme cinematic approaches you use in it. The, uh, the character goes through a lot of serious changes, and I think that you guys um, tried to convey that cinematically. Um, which might come as a surprise to people who only know your work from Marvel. And I think that a lot of people watching this, even people in the film community, only know your massive Marvel movies, or they might know you from Arrested Development or Community, but your roots are actually in the independent film world from far outside Hollywood, right? That's yes. right. We were we started making movies in Cleveland, Ohio in the mid-90s. Uh, we were inspired by the Sundance craze where it seemed like everyone was trying to pick up a, a 16 millimeter camera and, and shoot a movie and, and gain some uh, notoriety for it. And it was a, a craze that was inspired by um, Steven Soderbergh. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, with his movie Sex, Lies and Videotape at Sundance in either 88 or 89, interestingly enough, it was Soderbergh who then discovered us because of a micro budget movie we made in Cleveland in the 90s. So we, we did come up through the independent film scene. Well, before we turn to the uh, the scenes that we're going to have you break down for us, uh, could you tell us something about the the films or filmmakers who influenced your your cinematic uh, aesthetic? Wow, we, you know, Joe and I grew up real cinephiles, and we were both fans of commercial Hollywood filmmaking, and we were very fortunate to grow up near a wonderful place called the Cleveland Cinema Tech, which had an amazing program of art cinema and world cinema. And we devoured everything growing up. So our, our influences are pretty wide ranging. But I would say in relationship to Cherry, you know, we were very fond of the French New Wave and, and most specifically Truffaut. And I think, you know, his sort of spirit and adventurous uh, cinematic style and sort of a uh, level of self-awareness uh, may, you know, may, may in some ways speak most directly to Cherry. Yeah, I think, look, this movie is, uh, spans a 15 year life cycle in the life of the lead character. And uh, um, this character goes through some very intense experiences over the course of that life cycle, inclusive of which is falling in love with the girl of his dreams, uh, making the decision to um, enlist in the army during the Iraq war, goes to basic training, goes to war, suffers from PTSD, as you mentioned, uh, starts self-medicating with street drugs, becomes an addict, becomes a criminal to support the addict, and then ultimately gets incarcerated for over a decade uh, as a, a penance for um, becoming a criminal. So the movie spans an intense amount of experience for the character, and we wanted to break the movie up into six distinct chapters, where each chapter has a different tone. It's executed in a different style, uh, has different color palette, different lenses, different performance style. Uh, and this particular scene is from chapter two, when Cherry goes to basic training. And it was all shot with a single wide lens, the same lens. It's a distortive lens. We actively limit the uh, aspect ratio of the film at this point. So if you've been watching the movie up till this point, it's in a different aspect ratio. And at the start of basic training, the aspect ratio actually collapses because we want to show the world collapsing in on the character and it's starting to confine who he is and it's going to dictate uh, where his life goes from here. For us, it was sort of a blast of cold water in Cherry's face in terms of not understanding what he was going through. It's a very aggressive environment he finds himself dropped into. Here's a there's a young man who wanted to go to the war because he felt like he could possibly do some good there, wanted to become a medic. 
and he finds himself in basic training, which is sort of a hyper-aggressive environment where it's kind of hard to track for him to track the actual training. And then again, staying locked to the same lens throughout the entire experience, again, was sort of speaking to the sense of, of monotony and the sense of like a very being, being locked into a very rigid um, sort of uh, a rigid, unforgiving situation. Uh, so that we were sort of chasing all that in terms of uh, our, our choices in the sequence and, and in the scene. Well, how does that contrast with the very next scene when he actually experiences combat? What was what was your approach to him seeing what really happens in war? The way the chapters break down in the movie, the first chapter is him falling in love. And it's him in college meeting the girl of his dreams. There's a magical realism to it. There's a lot of soft focus. Everything falls off. The world is very much about he and this girl that he's fallen for. And the movie at its heart is a tragic modern love story. Uh, it's about two people, uh, this boy and this girl, who make decisions that they don't have life experience to make that unfortunately sends them on a journey into hell uh, and back again. Uh, the second chapter, as we talked about, uh, is absurdism. That is basic training. It's about disconnecting uh, while trying to maintain his humanity. The third chapter is he goes to war. And that absurdism translates into war, but a horror starts to creep in because there are elements that you know don't exist in basic training. There's death, there's, there's um, tragedy, uh, and there's things that his brain cannot process. You were wide awake when you got on the ground outside the wire for the first time. You expected to get shot at any moment. Even if you were in a spot where you couldn't see anyone for miles, you were nevertheless sure that there was a Haji out there who'd been waiting all day just to shoot you. Quebec, Romeo, Foxtrot. We are seven minutes out on route to tick. Over. Number one, bump it up. We have troops in the contact. All right, let's get us in there. Come on, guys. We have 17 to 20 people. Activity coordinated attack. Attention to immediate support. We're on the hellfire. Vicinity of. Fire! into existential crisis in this war that he doesn't know how to deal with. Again, he's too young to process these things. So the fourth chapter is about his PTSD. And that's what this next scene is from. And that chapter is about psychological war. It's about being trapped in your own mind, being trapped with these images that he can't escape. And it's very tense. It's the most disturbing part of the movie. It's certainly the most disturbing for me to watch as a filmmaker. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, he starts to, you'll notice in the scene that we're using very extreme uh, framing choices. We are pushing him off left or off right in the frame. He's starting to, uh, uh, and the frames are incongruous. It's not symmetrical opposite uh, editing. It is, uh, it's a unique frame on him and then a unique frame on the person that he's talking to. He's starting to uh, use alcohol and drugs to numb uh, his PTSD. And so the whole scene plays yeah, from this, um, sure. this, this distorted uh, point of view and the way that he's feeling about the world. He's now becoming hyper aggressive. He gets in a shouting match mm -hmm. with some patrons down below because 
you know, they're not dressed up for the theater. So he starts to do things that are illogical and emotional uh, because he can't control that, uh, that subconscious aspect of himself. Hey, thank you for thinking to do this. Why are we the only ones dressed up? Doesn't matter. I didn't notice. All well, these middle-aged people with money, for Christ's sakes. And they can't even be bothered to wear a jacket to the fucking theater. Stop. Yeah, I'm talking to you. What's your problem, dude? Dude, what's your problem? My problem's the fact you didn't even have the decency to take off your L.L. Bean before you came from the fucking Please golf club. Please be quiet. Please be quiet. Fuck you, motherfucker. I would you really like to go. No, now. babe, we're not going leave? anywhere. I would really like to leave. It's all right, man. There's nothing to fucking look at. This guy's just an asshole. Fucking take this L.L. Bean and shove it up your fucking ass. That was one of the things that struck us most about the novel and why we wanted to sort of translate this story to film is that at the heart of this character is a very relatable human, is the very relatable human experience of feeling disconnected and isolated. And that can, you know, and, and, and there's a, the way that it's conveyed in the novel is largely through a running sort of inner monologue that the character is having as he's going through a variety of, of extreme life experiences, sometimes extreme and sometimes normal life experiences. Um, and it, you know, that was really what we wanted to capture is this sense of isolation, this sense of disconnect, and figure out how do we connect to Cherry? How do we, how do we empathize with Cher what Cherry's going through? Because he makes some complicated decisions as we all do. Everybody makes some bad choices in life. Um, but how do you stay with a character stay with another human being despite the fact or while they're making bad choices and how do you continue to have that empathy for them through a complicated situation um, that was a lot of our experience in terms of how we structured structured the story and the narrative it's a good well, definitely a good yeah, contrast yeah. between basic training and ptsd um, but also because we want to illustrate the journey that this movie goes on one of the things that's so critical to us about the subject matter of this film it's very personal to us. We have friends and, and family who have died because of the opioid crisis, and we have others who are still struggling with their sobriety. And this is, you know, we're living in a world where a drug was scientifically manufactured to make people addicted to it in order to make money. Uh, and, and we're seeing the, you know, and it's, it's ravaging society. This is the most deadly year of the epidemic, which is coinciding with, with the pandemic. So. It's important for us uh, to try to generate empathy around this issue. We feel like there is a, uh, a, a lack of empathy uh, in the world today, and it's a progressive problem. Uh, it's progressing. It's, it has to do with the internet and technology, social media, distancing. We are dehumanizing and otherizing one another. Uh, and, and we feel strongly as, as individuals and as filmmakers that this crisis needs to be treated with empathy in order for us to overcome it. Uh, and, you know, incarceration is not the answer for, um, uh, for, for, for every aspect of, of this drug crisis that we're in the middle of. And that if we don't introduce empathy, um, and we can see this on all levels of this country at the moment, uh, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble in a couple of years. Well, gentlemen, um, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much for giving us some more insight into those scenes and into your film. Uh, it's certainly a, a very interesting approach, and um, especially when uh, knowing that it's in the, the town you came from and, and your personal connection to the stories, it, it, uh, it lends a lot of dimension to what you put on the screen. So thank you very much for your time, for joining us at Scene at the Academy. Uh, Anthony Russo and Joe Russo. Thank you, Thank Michael. you so much.